How is it possible that the pain of a terrible tragedy could actually be made worse? Six months after 71 people died in a fire at London's Grenfell Tower, we are looking at what has gone wrong since and what could or should have been done to alleviate the hurt. This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. Many of those who survived the fire lost loved ones and their homes as well. Some have been rehoused, others are trying to rebuild their shattered lives in temporary accommodation. Has enough been done to help the victims? The night our eyes changed. Rooms where both the extraordinary and the mundane were lived become forever tortured graves of ash. Oh, you political class. So serve out to corporate power. This is in West London. This is happening in West London. It's, there is an evacuation process. We have no word on the number of people. In West London, where 12 people have died and many are still missing. And I see the fire this residential blazing town. and coming up really fast. This corporate man slaughter will haunt you. Now hear him scream. Words cannot express. Please allow me to begin, though. 1.30 a.m. Heard the shouting from my window. People crying in the street, watching the burning of their kinfolk. Grenfell Tower now historically a symbol. Six months ago, on the 14th of June, Grenfell Tower went up in flames. And with it, 71 people lost their lives. Entire families were wiped out. Among the dead, a mother was found clutching her baby daughter. But the same questions still remain. How did it happen? Why did it happen? And who is going to be held to account? How did that happen? Like, how did the whole building go up? Or how did so many people die? How are we watching people burn in the Royal Borough of Kensington? Grenfell Tower hangs over people here like a charred tombstone, casting its shadow over Britain's richest borough. It didn't go away for like the first couple of days. Like, you could smell it. It was the cladding, but it was also like that skin burn smell. And like, you know when you burn hair by accident? Like, it was that nasty sort of sits at the back of your throat type smell. For those that lost loved ones, it's a constant reminder of what happened that night. A very hard time and I saw the fire still in front of us, still in common my memory after six months and still I can, when I see the fire, I the tower, I see the fire coming from there. After 11 weeks and they identify his remains. The current identify his remains. We will stay about another two, three weeks or nearly a month until we try to bury him. The fire started on the fourth floor. I open the window and I find, you know, a lot of noise, a lot of things, and I saw the, the, the fire as well. Mohammed Hariri managed to escape from the fifth floor. And never ever, you know, never even believe what, what's going on in that, in, in this building. In the, in the early morning, I had a panic attack, actually, and I've been to, uh, to the, uh, the ambulance, they check in my heart, check in my blood and everything. Yeah, and after that, you know, every night, nightmares, you know, because everywhere they talk about the Grandfather Tower, talking about what's happening, what's happening here, every single moment, you know. The UK government has announced an inquiry into what happened. Protesters and volunteers are no longer on the streets here, but life around Grenfell continues and the symbols and the struggle to ensure what happened here is not forgotten remain. And when the sun sets on Grenfell, the darkness brings with it a reminder for all. At night I feel like it's worse. I don't even like looking at it at night too much because it makes me think too much. You know when you look out into space and there's two stars and then there's that, I don't know what it's called, but that empty space in between it. So like the blackness, just pure darkness, that's what it's like. It's just, you lose yourself just looking into it. You lose yourself. It's just like, it's just so many emotions. But at the same time, it's just a void. Families have buried their loved ones, but the calls for justice still remain. And there seems to be little faith in the government's inquiry. Where is the justice? Where is the justice so far? Nothing. Every, every 14 of the months, they make a, a walk in silent walk for the justice. But where is the justice? 
Where is Burki Habtoum and her son Baru? Tell us, tell us, tell us. Where is Stefan? Emergency services told residents to stay in their flats. Fahim Mazri spoke to one man stuck on the 23rd floor. And this young man started asking us what to do. I really and truly I was so confused. I said, I said just pray. There were warnings though. Residents had raised concerns around safety. There were no sprinklers. There was no integrated alarm system. And the fire spread on the outside of the building because of cheap cladding. Half the families are yet to be given permanent homes. This is the reality of the aftermath of Grenfell. The fire may have long burnt out, the shell of the building is left. But it's what this fire says about Britain and how it treats those that are less well off that will be the lasting legacy of this tragedy. Well, I'm pleased to say, if that is the right word that we have with us at the round table, Omar Salha, who's part of the Grenfell Muslim Response Unit. We have Loki whose real name is Kareem, but we will refer to in whichever way he wishes, who wants to change our attitude on social housing, and grew up near Grenfell Tower. And we have also Andrew Boff, who's the deputy chair of the London Assembly's Housing Committee and wants to stop new tower blocks actually being built. Um, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, our programme will be broadcast after the memorial service, which is on the six-month anniversary. But let, let me come to you first of all, Loki, Kareem. <laughs> you knew three families that were in the tower block on the night of the fire, I believe. Three individuals, one of them part of a family, two of them living on their own. Uh, one family died, yeah. but two individuals survived. Do you want to tell us the story about how things have been over the last six months for anybody in particular? Well, I mean, precisely if we talk about one of the survivors, he is well known as a member of Grenfell Action Group, um, and unfortunately he was tragically vindicated by the events. Um, it was something that we'd been active on, um, resisting the Silchester Regeneration Plan. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we had perceived, um, ironically, Grenfell to be safe because of the refurbishment and the cladding that had been put on, on it. But in actuality, that had been the equivalent, as has come out in reports, as 30,000 uh, litres of petrol. Well, on a personal level, how has he found oh, the last six months in terms of finding housing, mental health, etc.? Well, 80% of the survivors are still in hotels, as you know. Um, the council are dipping into their £300 million reserves to a large extent um, to buy housing off the open market. And I think really that's indicative of what the neoliberal economic model has done to social housing uh, within this country. Um, it's important to look at three specific um, uh, factors which culminated to cause the problem. Number one was the managed decline of social housing, which we saw a council hand in glove with um, developers. You know, there are waivers that can be paid by property developers when they build new um, complexes to uh, skirt the obligation to build a certain quota of social housing. We know, as was reported in the New York, New York Times, September um, 2016, by that point, uh, Kensington and Chelsea had received 33.5 million in these types of payments to, for property developers to um, skirt the obligation to build social well, housing. Should we ask Andrew, mm -hmm. um, who's on the Greater London Assembly, then you're part of the Housing Committee, which doesn't have a direct say in what yeah. happens, but it sets out strategy and it also tells boroughs such as the Royal uh, Borough of uh, Kensington and Chelsea how to manage or will hopefully do, do, do this. Do you think things have changed in any way, shape or form? Um, I get the sense that there is a desire for change, yes, absolutely. I That's not very good though if there is no change. I think there must be change and uh, I, I think one of the things that was probably uh, I think missold to the residents in the aftermath was the speed with which the government could respond to uh, their, their problems and I think a lot was promised and with my experience over many years of, of local government a lot was promised that I don't think though they could deliver um, and and therefore there is so expectations were high yes I think so but, but were any of those expectations realistic as well as unrealistic I think the, the, the expectation that all those residents need to be rehoused is an absolutely genuine and concrete one I think the time scale that they were given was unrealistic anyone who's been in housing for in London for a short while will know you can't just magic up 200 300 vacancies um, 
in, especially in a borough yeah. which has the smallest social housing. But, but as I understand uh, it, some of them have actually been offered places in other tower blocks and they're going to be scared out of their wits, well, the idea of going in there. Yeah. Uh, do you think anything has gone right, Omar? If anything has gone right, it's the response from the community, which has uh, only um, reinforced uh, our understanding that uh, community politics and community uh, response in, in cases like this of, of uh, tragedies, um, the local authorities have very limited influence and um, as a matter of fact the, the local authorities were nowhere to be seen in the, in the initial aftermath of the tragic fire and um, there was no real sense of leadership from, from local authorities. I think we saw many people, individuals, people, na local neighbours, local residents, um, local churches, mosques uh, coming to the scene. Uh, it was almost a scene out of Armageddon, if you will, and there were nowhere from the authorities to actually take leadership. Um, and I think it was a testament to the fact that there was service, um, service was, was important and service was the, the, the core sort of theme, if you will, yeah. of, uh, of all those who got together. And even what ensued afterwards, the next uh, couple of months after the fire, Again, there was very lack um, uh, empathy. There was a sort of, uh, the authorities were speaking from a, a level of position of arrogance. In terms of the community being the safety net, we know that there is essentially a war on public space in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. They wanted to sell off the library to the private school next to it. The only reason they conceded and backed off was because Grenfell happened. The only reason we perceive our houses as safe now is because Grenfell happened, because they backed off on Silchester Regeneration Plan. Secondly, we know they sold off the college and they're going to turn them into flats. We know they sold off a youth centre, which has been a real centre of um, development of brilliance for young people in the area from sound engineering to sports to boxing to football that that now is full of donations because it was opened by the people that used to work there to receive donations uh, during uh, the crisis. Uh, is your concern not that um, these might be turned into houses which is, is what is needed of in course. that area but the fact that local facilities but are certain being types sacrificed. Of but let's be clear it's certain types so of houses. So these would be private houses sold off at a profit? We have no reason to think otherwise. You know, this is what has been indicated to us is we have precedents in terms of Wernington Square turned into Portobello Square. We have um, precedents in terms of the Haygate Estate. We see what's happening to Ellsbury right now. You know, there is precedents within this. However, there's also precedents in a counterculture of space claiming within the Labrick Grove area. We saw it in Frestonia. We saw it in the Free School. We even saw the... Phoenix, which emerged, emerged out of the murder of Kelso Cochrane and the riots on Bramley Road in 1958 and the murder in 1959 of Notting Hill Carnival. The people in the area are directly trying to claim some type of participatory role in the decision-making process. And that's going to go on and, and we still don't have it on the, um, on the inquiry the, panel. I, I find that fascinating because that's something that's actively being debated at a London-wide level at the moment. The Mayor of London is being urged by some parties uh, to ensure that when regeneration Regeneration programs are decided that the residents of those those estates that are being regenerated have some kind of right to be balloted as to whether or not that should go ahead. And I've been quite supportive of that, and other parties have. And, and we, we, I hope the housing strategy that the mayor has is out for consultation at the moment. I hope that he decides to incorporate that within the housing strategy. What the residents are saying is actually, no, we want to be on a panel which ends up making the decision. Yeah, it gives us more than just so a cons consultation. Somebody precisely. asking us what we want. And we want something where we can make decisions. Precisely. So yeah. the, the, the problem with such statements is it's very vague and um, they actually give another false expectation on residents, um, which, um, you know, the, the residents, the survivors, the bereaved families, they are intelligent people and they are people who are very well aware of what's happening around them. You know, some of the examples that Loki has mentioned in the, in the local area. And uh, what we have seen time and time again over the past six months is, again, opportunities of rebuilding trust constantly being broken down. Um, there is no um, real cohesive communication between the local authorities and the families. Um, and again, I think it's, um, it's a very, very important that I think some of the families yesterday were at the Houses of Parliament speaking to some of the MPs. And one of the, the survivors mentioned that we are still trying to train these MPs and politicians how to speak to us. They do not understand or they, do, they cannot relate. And I think part of the, um, I believe one of the, the, the QC uh, lawyers who mentioned this to uh, the judge with respect to diversity on the panel. You know, how many people who sit on the panel have actually lived in social housing? Uh, it's very important that, are they relatable? Can they relate to some of these families? Well, let I me just, let me just. a very strong point. Let, let me. And the diversity of that panel is very, very important. 
the, the level to which it makes a, a decision, well, if it, that's down to what a public inquiry actually is. And it's there are very rules set on, rules there? about how it's made, yeah. but you're absolutely right. Can I, can I move on to something else yeah, that was please. said at the inquiry by Michael Mansfield, mm -hmm. human rights lawyer representing mm -hmm. a lot of the families? And he says, um, the casualties are far greater than we've estimated, more than the 71. That is, the people who live around the immediate vicinity, far greater even than that, because everybody who lives in a tower block will have been affected by what has happened. And I go on to something else from a local doctor, somebody you, you might well know, John Green. Do you know John? Don't know. Uh, okay, runs a big trauma center. Okay. He says this is going to be the biggest mental health response uh, ever seen in Europe. 11,000 people potentially affected. Are people being given the sort of... Um, help that they need, rather not just a roof over their head, but the, the help they need. 11,000 people mm -hmm. when 71 people lost their lives, but the, the spread of the, the effect of it is enormous. Well, anything I can offer at best really can be anecdotal, but um, according to what I've heard from people, it has not been enough. But I personally have not. You know, we were sent a week after it happened a newsletter by the council saying we should get air purifiers in our house. Now, what we need to talk about and what this inquiry needs to deal with is the extent to which regulatory bodies have been penetrated by captains of industry. What we're talking about is we're talking about the privatization of BRE in 97. We're talking about Celotex, the final end of the outsourcing when it comes to the cladding on the building, who were boasting of penetrating government and entering government in 2011. We're um, talking about Brofema, the, the, the lobbyists for this um, poisonous foam which gives off cyanide and which was flammable, which they knew was flammable because they were launching cases against people trying to hold them accountable mm. for that. The point is this, we have no way of actually quantifying how much damage has been done. Uh, by what happened mm. psychologically but health-wise. We don't know how much this is going to affect us in the future. Um, so I think, you know, answers are needed. And mm. in terms of the inquiry, I'm quite interested because, you know, the police have taken 31 million documents and are looking through them. And I'm sure that's going to take one and a half a million time. documents alone from the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Yeah. And as far as I understand, you know, it will take them two years to complete the forensic studies. However, Sir Francis Morbick only has access to 270,000 documents, as far as I understand. So really, what kind of inquiry are we talking about? How narrow is it going to be? As I say, is it going to look at the extent to which these regulatory bodies have people on them who have a vested interest in selling insulation, which is poisonous, not just in Grenfell, we're talking about hospitals, we're talking about schools nationwide. Why was it after um, Lacanon fire when six people died in Camberwell and it was suggested that sprinklers and the issue of cladding was addressed, they weren't addressed? Why is it that after the fire in Scotland they were able to say, look, we don't want any more of this cladding. It's illegal in Germany, it's illegal in the United States, it's not meant to be above three stories, mm. but yet they put it on. Would, would you say that people feel like they have been isolated and let down? The those, people those in particular, you're talking about the survivors and bereaved families? Survivors and, and those in the immediate vicinity, those related to it. Because I want to bring up something in just a second. I mean, uh, so the, the, the Lacanau fire that uh, Loki's talking about back in 2009, I think, um, in Southwark, um, and uh, what ensued after that, uh, also Shepherd's Bush, very close to Grenfell, Grenfell Tower, uh, another, another tower block which was uh, also on, uh, on fire. Um, these these uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, grievances have been raised much previous to the actual fire itself. And again, you know, when you say people are isolated, I mean, there, there, there have been many, many blogs which was written about mm. the fire safety measures. Um, the fact that there are not any, there aren't any splink, uh, sprinklers in these uh, tower blocks, um, you know, something which is, you know, quite basic, to be honest. Um, the fact that Grenfell Tower has only one staircase, so there was no f real fire exit. Um, no, so all of these questions, when you, when you... I mean, these people have already been isolated. Um, I mean, the other, sorry, one yeah, no, last thing. Jump in. in terms of the psychological aspect, I think people are dealing with a serious existential crisis. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you are witnessing a human being dying, is the most morally correct thing for you to do to stand and watch or is it to turn away? That's something that we're all dealing with up until today. We have to deal with that dilemma. We're trapped in this voyeuristic, impotent spectatorship of suffering where we watch people we know yeah. crying for help and dying. <coughs> so, so if people are being ignored or not asked the, the right questions, how, what, what do you make of this, all of you? This isn't just directed at you as a conservative. No, 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 no. We've, got to, we've got to ensure that, 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 it, that we recognise that the, the, the victims are not 
not just the people who were in the block, there were the people who were affected. And indeed the people who were, who were in, in proximity. Yeah. Uh, pure air quality issues, you know, I had constant criticisms that we weren't quick enough in dealing with the uh, problems that we had with air quality issues in the area. Let me throw this out. But in the government terms of just sensitivity, if yes. I may, because we're, we're, we're yeah. pretty short of time. Tory activists in Kensington and Chelsea, this hasn't been denied, have come under attack for what's called a crass and insensitive survey that asked residents to rate the importance of the Grenfell Tower tragedy on a scale of 0 to 10, along with things such as keeping council tax low, rubbish collection, recycling, and Crossrail yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, for goodness sake. Yes. I'm not asking you this as a conservative, no, just no, as human no, beings. No. Where are people coming from be, that do this? Be, be, the, 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 they, they're asking a question and in that they thought they were asking a question and hoping for the, to give people an opportunity to be able to say this is a very, very important issue. It comes out as crass though, you're absolutely right. I don't, I don't believe that The so best intentions in, totally it wrong. It was best intentions right. and if we can go back to what Omar was saying, it's about this sort of understanding of what people went through, a language, a common language we need to be able to understand what those victims are going through. I mean, the government's allocated what, 28 million pounds for, I, I don't know if that's enough, I don't know, it should be double that, treble that, half You're that. You're about 300 million pounds yeah, in the bank. But, but just, for, just for those issues related to uh, mental health and further health uh, issues that people in the area may suffer, suffer from. The, the point is, we need to ensure that there's that continual feedback so that we don't make that pro make these mistakes again that we, we that led up to the okay, to if, if I may inter, um, interrupt sorry um, one thing that I would like to say is we have to view the causes of this as systemic we have to look at the fact that a thousand um, jobs from the fire brigade have gone thanks to Tory cuts. We've mm -hmm. lost 10 uh, fire stations, 29 fire engines. But there You're was, talking there was about no criticism. I'm sorry, I, I've heard this before, but mm -hmm. there, there were few criticisms of the response of the police uh, to the, the Grenfell disaster. They, 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 and, and sorry, the police and the fire service. Lucy Masoud, the I, leader I of the, of the not, fire brigade. I did not hear any. Did they Lucy not have um, the leader they, of the fire enough turntable ladders? That, that, that they had was to bring the them one in from thing. Surrey. Absolutely. No, no, no. You're Absolutely. talking about the fire brigade's union. Yeah. The leader came out and directly said that we've had 100 million pounds of cuts to our service. Had this happened outside of London, it would have been impossible for us to deal with. Now, because of the penetration of government by captains of industry, we have places all over the country, whether they're hospitals and schools, that are wrapped in this cladding. How are the fire services going to be able to deal with something if it happens in one of those places? Well, People are sleeping in death know. traps. I don't expect I, I, you to I, be I, able to I, answer okay. that, Andrew. But we, I started this by asking you, Omar, whether you felt anything had uh, gone right in the six months. Now, apart from the sense of community that you've, you, you, you mentioned the fact that people have stood up and been counted and done the best thing for their fellow man. Uh, can you two, and then you as well, think of anything that you think has gone right, or has it been a disaster from start to I, I do think that the, 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 the Let, Let's ignore the community spirit, anything yeah. else? I, and I, I don't think, mean ignore it. But I, I think, mean, no, I, do, I, th I think it's made government look in on itself and say what went wrong. And in that we, I, I think, you know, Grenfell, the, the Grenfell issue is not going to finish this year, next year, 10 years, 20 years. It's now with us. The, all the issues related to it, it means that government has got to look in on itself, how it involves people in the process of providing housing, how it listens to people and trying to avoid ignoring people. And realistically, no more tower blocks? That, that's your plan? I, I don't want to use Grenfell. I, I, I've been opposed to, to tower blocks. I, I was born in a council house. You know, I, 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 I know the but benefits. But is that realistic that when, when but we have problem, so many people coming to problem with social house, The problem with social housing is very often when you ghettoise people into blocks, the quality is inferior. It's inferior to that of uh, market housing. It's an and idea. that has to change. And actually, nobody, nobody chooses to live in a, a tower block with, if they've got a family, if they have an option of a home on the ground with a garden and a door that opens yeah, out. Unless you can be certain of the safety standards, you have a penthouse and it's in, in Manhattan. Um, Loki, anything good, anything positive to say? Other than about the community, which we, we've mentioned and we won't ignore, but other than that. Well, one good thing is that, you know, unfortunately, tragically, um, our homes are safe. We did not view them as now, you know, 
had Grenfell not have happened and there were people that were active against the Silch and Chester G regeneration and, and on issues of the refurbishment that lived in Grenfell who were vindicated in death and that's an important thing to note. So that's one positive thing. 17 um, Tory councillors are either deselected or resigned. That's almost half of the Tory councillors in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. That's a positive thing. Better people we'll in see where that go We'll see where that goes. We'll see in May. But in terms of... Um, the positive things is the phoenix that has arisen out of it is a community that is more cognizant of its interests than ever before and is really not willing to be pushed around anymore in terms of the struggle between public and private space in the borough. Okay, well listen, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for coming in. It, it, it's a terrible occasion. This is six months on. The inquiry has only just started to get going. There's an awful lot of animosity. Whether in fact the makeup of the panel changes, we will have to wait and see. But that is Grenfell. Uh, six months after the terrible events that saw 71 people lose their lives and so many more be deeply affected by the events of that summer night. From me, David Foster, and from the guests, thank you very much for watching. Hope to see you next time for Roundtable. Bye-bye.